So let's start then, where are we now? Well, where we are now is essentially at the end of the recovery phase uh, from the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and I say sort of advisedly because it does vary a bit from region to region and, and country to country. But unlike most of our post-war recessions, this one was a financially driven recession. And so we've had a rather long period of deleveraging that has taken place, which is now nearing completion in North America, but has really quite a bit further to go uh, in Europe, for example. Uh, and then there are other uh, parts of the world where that was not the primary uh, result of, of the recession. So we're, we're at that sort of stage where in 2015, if, if you had asked me in 2010 or 11, when would we really emerge? I would have said we would emerge about 2014. It's probably 2015 now. And you can see from the, on the handout that you have really quite different uh, behaviors uh, across the different countries in 2015 and 16. The United States quite clearly finishes its delivering uh, uh, now, roughly, at the end of this year. Canada, we probably got a little bit farther to go. Europe, a lot farther to go, which is why you have those rather poor performance in the Euro, Euro area carrying on. And then very different performance in the emerging market countries, which really didn't have the same leverage problem initially, largely because they got whacked in 1997 and had, had, were actually looking after their leverage problems over the early part of the decade, while we in North America and in the United States in particular were building it up. And so when you look at, and then finally China, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Uh, China slowing, uh, but still, by any standards, 7% plus growth looks pretty good. Uh, it only doesn't look good relative to the 10% they were generating earlier. Um, so you have a world then that over the next couple of years is growing at, let's say, 3.5%, which is probably about the speed limit we're growing faster than that. We clearly would be mopping up uh, some of the excess demand that's out there. Uh, so it's growing at about its speed limit. Um, and we still have some real pockets of excess supply uh, around particular Europe, Japan, uh, surprisingly now emerging some excess supply uh, in some of the emerging market countries, uh, such as Brazil, and for a totally different reason in Russia. So that's kind of where we're starting. Um, that is, finally at the end of the recovery period, a couple of sort of what you might think of as normal years, the, the next couple of years. But it's not going to feel that good uh, over the next couple of years because there's still a lot of change going on. So that's, that's sort of the starting point. So what happens then when you get out and look at the, the next part of the decade? Because that's when you really see some of the structural issues that are going to come to bear. So you're just finishing the end of a cyclical downturn, uh, or putting it differently, you're towards the end of the recovery from a cyclical downturn. If you look over those three years, 2017, 2020, you really have to, in your mind, think quite hard about what the factors uh, that are going to be at play. And that is the other little table, which the word table for you, 
because uh, this is really the thought process uh, that one has to go through in trying to think about that medium term future. So, and you know, in very simple terms, what's likely to happen to consumption, what's likely to happen to investment, what are governments uh, going to do over that period, uh, and how is monetary policy going to be conducted or how are financial markets going to perform over that period. And so that's kind of the question list there. Um, and what we have seen and are likely to see both in the advanced economies and in the emerging markets is a continued uh, uh, skew in the distribution of income uh, towards the higher end, towards skills, um, and rather weaker uh, growth of incomes in the, quote, middle class, unquote. Um, and that means that consumption per se uh, is not going to have quite the drive that one might have expected had income being more evenly distributed across households. But that picture, while well, that's the general picture applying to both the advanced and the emerging market countries, um, it is a very different picture country by country. And I want to just say a few words about some of the big issues there. The second is, is expectations, which <laughs> theoretical economists would say uh, are either mechanically determined or we don't really know much about it. Um, and in fact, it's, it is a very squishy uh, concept, uh, what expectations are. Nevertheless, it is absolutely true that for business, um, while business is not supposed to be emotional, in fact, there is actually quite a bit of emotion that goes on. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. Um, and whether the climate is one of optimism or one of uncertainty and pessimism really does matter a lot in terms of, uh, in terms of willingness of, of business to invest, in particular to invest in long-lived capital number one, and number two, uh, to hire people on a permanent basis. And I think it is fair to say that as one looks out, uh, there are geopolitical reasons that expectations are perhaps running below uh, and will run below what uh, the economies of the world could actually deliver. Because we've gone through a period as you well know from, let's say, 2008 to 2011, or to, certainly to 2010, when across the world, government spent a lot, quite appropriately, to try deal uh, with the uh, financial crisis. Uh, and we have, and some were in trouble before uh, that, and so, Governments, by and large, uh, don't have as much fiscal room to maneuver uh, as they uh, uh, would, A, would like to have, but B, as the markets will allow them to have. And so we will have a period really that stretches out to 2020 where government demand likely will grow more slowly uh, than GDP, uh, and hence provide some restraining pressure on the economy. That likely be offset by rather low policy interest rates, uh, because that scenario I've just traced is one that would tend to lead to excess supply. So you offset that, then a central bank will rather low policy interest rates. So that's sort of the general picture on the demand side. 
What about the supply side? This is more difficult, at least um, the last bit on the page is more difficult. We know we've got aging populations at rather different rates uh, over that period, 2017, 2020. Um, really quite sharply aging in a country like Japan or Germany. Uh, generally speaking, Europe getting old reasonably quickly. Um, United, St <laughs> United States and Canada, uh, somewhere in the middle. And then a few very young countries like India and Brazil. Um, China in a very interesting position that they are going to start to get old really fast, but not until sort of the middle of the decade of the uh, 2020s. So labor supply, in fact, is, is restrained, more restrained over that period, certainly in the advanced economies, uh, than we have known it for the last, um, almost the last half century. Uh, and that will affect growth, of course. In the emerging markets, in particular when you think of countries like the Asian Tigers and China, a lot of the rural to urban migration uh, has already taken place. So a lot of the move from very low productivity uh, rural areas to much higher productivity or urban areas, a lot of that has taken place. So we won't have that same driver of growth in the emerging markets as we get out to the end of this decade as we had in earlier periods. With a couple of big exceptions, as I mentioned, India being the, the biggest uh, exception in that, but certainly uh, in many uh, many uh, emerging markets. And I've left Africa out of this because it actually represents such a small share uh, of the global economy at the moment and over this period, even though it will be very important when we get out to 2030 and beyond. Finally, the biggest question and the one that this huge debate about is are we going to go through a period where technological innovation slows down and hence productivity growth slows down, whether you consider that as productivity of capital, productivity of labor, or, or total factor productivity. I think that's a big question and we don't know. The answer is we don't know. Uh, there's, I think, reasonably good arguments on both sides uh, on this one. Uh, and uh, one should never be afraid to say that you just don't know. Um, so those are the factors. Well, what is that? Where does that leave us then as you look at the different parts of the world? Let's start with the United States, which is in that bottom table on the handout. Um, what, we, what we see there in the United States is, is that growth is likely, uh, and this is potential, is really likely to be less than what we see over the next couple of years, because there's still some excess supply to be mopped up, but nevertheless running at sort of two and a half percent. And that's largely on the, on the assumption that their productivity growth over that period looks not terribly different than in the early part of the decade. For Canada, if you make the same assumption that the productivity growth out there 2017 to 20 uh, looks sort of like what we had from 2000 to 2010, then our potential actually drops well below uh, 2% in this country, largely due uh, to the fact that we have a aging labor force. There's a, always a question about what's hap gonna happen to the labor force participation rates but even if one assumes some improvement in labor force participation. So, that, that, so when people today say, oh, this is terrible that we're only growing at 2.2 or 2.3, that's a lot better in aggregate terms than what we're going to see as we get out to the end of the decade. And it's very important to think about that uh, if you uh, are in business and trying to make plans. Europe, 
a little bit of a pickup to not a very great figure, um, but still even in 2017, 2020, especially in the peripheral areas of Europe, uh, we still get some mopping up of excess supply. Japan uh, continues to be enormous problem with the worst demographics of any of the uh, major countries. In China, here's a very interesting one. Um, and no one, no one knows for sure uh, what will happen. But my guess is that by the end, by 2020, we're going to be looking at growth rates in China that look about the same as you see there uh, in the rest of the world, around 3.5%. And that's largely because the Chinese have an enormously difficult transition to make, a transition from consumption representing only 40% of their economy to something that looks much more like the rest of the world, which means they're just not going to get the kick from investment, uh, the kick to growth that's coming uh, from investment today. And so all of that tells you that when you look out there, global growth uh, is going to be better than three, but perhaps not very much better than three. Uh, and so uh, Madame Lagarde's comments about mediocre, um, it's not really that it's so mediocre. It's that there, have been, there are changes going on in the structure of the world that mean that those are the sorts of growth rate that you're going to get. Well, when you get those, those rather low growth rates and the tendency to excess supply uh, over that period, then, of course, what would you expect? You would expect that the monetary authorities would try to provide accommodative policy because there will be some generalized containment of inflation, given that growth is not that good, that, that we have uh, some excess supply out there in most countries, although, as I said, we'll differ from country to country. And so what one would expect then is that we would not return to the sort of interest rates which we got used to over the period 1997, which was the Asian crisis to 2007, which was the beginning of the financial crisis. Uh, and that we would be looking at worldwide policy rates that will generally be lower than they were in, in that period. And secondly, because we've got some tendency to excess demand, some weakness on the investment side, that we will continue to have in a lot of the world uh, reasonably large savings generation. And so the betting would be uh, that that's where interest rates will end up, well below the sorts of numbers we observed uh, in the early part of the decade of 2000 to 2007. Um, and the central banks um, will tend to have uh, a rather heavy foot on the accelerator side. And that makes sense. That makes sense in a world where, uh, where uh, we have constraints uh, on the demand side. Unfortunately, we came out of the 2008 period uh, scarred by, let's call them financial market excesses. Um, and there has been enormous pressure from politicians on the regulators to constrain the ability of financial institutions to lend. And so while central banks have pushed interest rates down in order to try generate real demand, at the same time, the regulator which in our case is separate from the central bank, but in the United States or now in the United Kingdom is part of the role of the central bank, and now in, even in, in the Eurozone, 
The regulator, pressed by politicians, has said, no, 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 we don't want this liquidity that monetary policy is generating. We don't want that to create conditions that might lead to a financial crisis. And so what regulators have been doing is they've been dramatically increasing the capital requirements that banks have. They've been putting uh, a number of controls on what banks do. And they've been saying, no, individual institutions have to carry more liquidity. So a lot of what central banks are doing, in fact, doesn't get translated into real growth out there because the translation or transmission mechanism through the banking system has been blocked up by rules and regulations because of the great fear that governments will have to, quote, bail out, unquote, uh, the financial system. Uh, and so this brings me to the, the last point. So where are we going forward and, and what ought to be done then with these two parts of the financial system, the monetary policy part, the setting of interest rates, and the regulatory part. Because after all, what both of those together are doing are creating credit conditions that will allow the real economy to expand or creating a drag on the expansion of the real economy. And so this is, it's a very interesting conundrum as we sit here in 2014 or beginning of 2015, looking at the second half of the decade, do we really think that the best way to operate, for the authorities to operate in the financial system, is to create a lot of liquidity and then put a lot of constraints on to make sure that liquidity doesn't translate into real economic activity, but at the same time, preventing, we would hope, banks and financial institutions from failing? Or would we be better, in fact, to have somewhat bet higher nominal interest rates, um, a policy rate which is, is set higher, but remove some of the constraints on the system? And this is a very important debate that's going on and will indeed in a very real way, shape that longer term uh, outlook. In fact, it will shape even the shorter term outlook, but has real implications for the longer term outlook. Because what we've done is, in fact, through these very tight regulation to try to avoid another financial crisis, we've created a lot of inefficiencies uh, in the financial system. And so it's quite important uh, that uh, the regulatory side, uh, globally, that we think that about that very hard. And it's particularly important for us here in Canada because we did an amazingly good job for the 20 years up to, well, let me be a little careful, from 1990 to 2007, uh, we did an amazingly good job um, in Balancing the efficiency aspects, i.e. allowing the financial institutions to operate in the most efficient way, and uh, the stability aspects, not having them uh, get into the same sort of trouble that the Europeans or the Americans got into. And we did it, we did it through uh, rules or guidelines that were fairly general and through a lot of discussion between the regulators, the bank, and the financial institutions. Since 2008, the world has moved to American-style regulation, which I would submit is enormously inefficient um, in terms of having to write a lot of laws. But it's also moved to uh, regulation uh, which uh, makes it 
rather expensive uh, to use financial intermediaries, uh, and indeed is pushing a lot more of the financial activity out of the banking system into markets, markets which are regulated by securities commissions that have historically done an extraordinarily poor job and basically uh, don't understand uh, fixed income markets uh, or derivatives markets very well. And so I think we've got a problem as we look out there. And it does mean that we in Canada are going to have to think hard about not following the, the rules, the strict rules uh, of Basel uh, and uh, the global regulatory community and returning to our more principles-based regulation. And that's a very interesting debate. Those of you that are going out and going to work in financial institutions or indeed are going to work in some way in financial markets uh, are going to see this particular thing uh, play out over time. And if we do it well in Canada, if we continue to have a financial system that uh, is both reasonably stable but, but efficient, uh, then that uh, will allow us not only to grow faster but also to capture a larger share of the global financial business.